gonna look at now is bone. Uh, another one of the supporting connective tissues. Again, the big difference between this and cartilage is really the calcification of that matrix. So bone doing a lot of protection, things like the skull, the ribs. Uh, it also is where we attach our muscles to to allow that movement. Uh, within the bone marrow, specifically the red bone marrow, it's where we make a lot of our different blood cells, actually all of our different blood cells. And again, X is a big warehouse for maintaining calcium levels in the body, calcium phosphate levels in the body. Uh, really serves as a warehouse for that. So bone, unlike cartilage, is very vascular. Lots of blood supply to it. Again, that's where we make all of our blood cells. Uh, the other thing with bone is it is kind of one of these things that's constantly, it's dynamic. It's constantly changing. Uh, as you are putting more stresses on a bone, it will modify its structure to try to deal with that. If you're putting less, structure, uh, less uh, stresses on the bone, it will also respond to that. Uh, this is part of the reason people that are bedridden, people that go to space, can have atrophy and loss of bone density. Uh, and again, if we are not continually fixing this up and doing some of the stuff with that, bones can become unhealthy if they are not allowed to can kind of continuously have these changes take place. We're going to see with bones, there's really a lot of those same type of bone cells we've talked, I mean, the cells we talked about before. So we have the blast cells. So again, like chondroblasts and fibroblasts before it, these are the ones that produce the matrix. In this case, they call it osteoid, which is some of the fibers as well as those calcium salts that are going to become the bony matrix. Once we trap these osteoblasts within the bony matrix, we call them osteocytes, not chondrocytes, because now we're dealing with bone. Uh, the one thing that bone has is it also has cells that can help reabsorb this. So because it is a storage warehouse for calcium, one of the ways when we have excess calcium, we'll deposit new bone. Uh, if we need calcium and we don't have it coming in from our diet, we can reabsorb bone. Uh, we do that with a cell called an osteoclast, which is going to release different uh, acidic types of uh, secretions that can allow us to reabsorb that bony matrix and make the calcium available to the rest of the body. Again, that bony matrix is called the osteoid. It is going to be those collagen fibers. So bones, if you were to actually dissolve one in, like, let's say, vinegar, the acetic acid, you will be left with the the fibers of that. So it is a, it does have a lot of collagen fibers present in it. Uh, the other thing is the ground substance here. So we have some of those amino glycans and things like that. But the main thing with this osteoid that's secreted is two different calcium salts uh, that together when they combine become something called hydroxyapatite, which is that very hard matrix that bone has. So osteoblasts, a lot of times we'll see these uh, lining both the inside and the outside of the bone. So you can see right here, these are osteoblasts. It's kind of squared off cells lining. This would be actual bones with osteocytes here. So this is probably spongy bone, for example. Uh, you can see the osteoblasts lining this. Osteocytes trapped within the bone. Again, the osteoblasts are in the process of forming bone. Osteocytes are these ones that have been trapped within the bony matrix. Uh, you don't have a picture of it over here. An osteoclast, we're gonna see it as a multinucleated cell that has this reabsorption area here, this reabsorption lacuna that can actually take some of that bone back. So osteoblasts, like I said, their main job is to produce osteoid, which is the bony matrix as well as the collagen fibers. So they are going to release this. They release also those inorganic salts, these two different calcium salts that are going to become hydroxyapatite. Uh, again, these cells are influenced by a number of different things, but uh, one of the things that does influence them outside of uh, growth hormone is going to be actually testosterone and estrogen. Uh, the other thing that will influence this is putting stressors on the bone. If you stress the bone, it will activate more osteoblasts to deposit more bone. So increased muscle use, increased weight-bearing activities will increase activity of osteoblasts. Osteocytes, like I said, these are ones that are trapped within that hydroxyapatite matrix. Uh, they sit in their own little lacunae, which is a space in there, and they do have these little canals or extensions going off from that. These are called canaliculi. But these osteocytes are really there to maintain the bone that they're trapped within. 
The other thing we'll see is these ones that kind of look like jellyfish. Uh, those are osteoclasts, so generally multinucleated, as you can see right here. You get this little resorption area called the Houship's Lacunae. They are releasing a lot of lysosome contents, which are digestive enzymes, high in acid, that can reabsorb this bone and, again, free up that calcium for the body to use. Uh, I have that little ruffled border, as you can see there, where they're actually little pieces of that cytoplasm coming out. So osteoclasts do this by releasing and sealing off this area. They release an acidic environment underneath it and then seal it in. And this will dissolve that bone in here and make that calcium and other components that were in the bone available for the body to use. Like it says here, it transfers collagenase and proteins into this environment here to break down the collagen fibers, the calcium salts. Phagocytizes some of the stuff here, but again, that calcium becomes available to the rest of the body. Again, bones are a combination of both organic and inorganic components. So the inorganic components of this are those two different calcium salts. Uh, that What becomes that hydroxyapatite? It is really that calcium. Uh, the organic components of bone are really the collagen fibers and the rest of that ground substance. So those glycoproteins that are present within that matrix. Again, there needs to be a good balance of these two things. They should be about 50-50 when it comes to bone. Too much inorganic, the bone becomes brittle and not nearly as strong. Uh, too little inorganics, the bone becomes weak and bendy. So either of those things are not good for bone. So it needs to have this kind of balancing act going on there where the organic and inorganic components need to be in the right combinations. We're going to see when we look at bone under the microscope, we have two main types. You have what is called compact or lamellar bone. This is on the outside. It's much thicker, does not have marrow spaces in there. And we're going to see this is going to have these repeating units of structure called osteons or reversion systems that are present in it. Spongy bone, also known as cancellous bone, is going to be on the inside of the bones or a lot of times housed within the heads of the bone, the expanded regions of the bones. Uh, similar structure somewhat, but it does not have these osteon systems that are really acting as canals for nerves and blood vessels and other stuff like that to travel through. Spongy bone is not nearly as thick because of that. It's, we can really get by without having these big canals traveling through it. So you can see here, this would be kind of the head of a bone, let's say it's the head of the tibia. The compact bone is on the outside. In the interior, you're going to have this cancellous or spongy bone gets its name because it does look a little bit like a sponge. So this is decalcified bone on this one here to do this slide. Uh, bone is one of these ones that the slides, if you actually look at calcified bone, it is not going to look like a lot of these ones. You won't see nuclei, you won't see other stuff like that. It really looks kind of black and white. Uh, the main thing is if you don't decalcify bone, if you try to make a slide out of it, if you've ever tried to eat a steak, you can't cut through the bone. Because of this, it means that really the only way to make this slide is to get a little piece of bone and then shave it down and sand it down real thin so we can pass light through it. When you do that, it would peel all these nuclei out of here, any of these blood vessels out of here, and you would just be left with dust-filled spaces. And we'll see that on some of these other slides here. This one's decalcified, so you can see the canals traveling through this. You can see the osteocytes trapped in these lacunae here. Spongy bone, you can see a lot of space surrounding it, and then you only have these little, they would kind of call these spicules, or if you want to say little columns of bone. And you can see these aren't nearly as thick as what's going on here. So because of this, a lot of the nutrients can diffuse in from blood vessels through little the little canals that we talked about, those canaliculi that I mentioned, can get into these osteocytes in here. In that compact bone, because it's much thicker, we need actual blood vessels traveling through it. Uh, the first bone that's laid down is what we call woven bone. Uh, forms quickly. Generally, we replace that later on. Uh, again, that's going to be much more similar to that spongy bone. The mature bone, that lamellar bone, this is where you're going to see these repeating osteon systems. So again, these circular concentric kind of rings like a tree, this column with a centralized canal around it, and lacunae trapped in these rings around that central canal. 
So if you're looking at compact bone, it is going to have a structure that looks something like this. Each one of these little circle structures, where it's showing like four of them right here, those would be considered these reversion systems or an osteon. You can see there is little rings of bone laid around this. These are called lamellae. These are formed by uh, fibers that are traveling, you know, these collagen fibers that are either spiraling up this way and then the next layer would be spiraling up the opposite way so they're perpendicular so the bone doesn't twist well in either direction. We don't want it to twist, we want it to resist that. You can see all these little circular structures, the ASEAN systems. We're gonna see that surrounding the outside, you're gonna have some lamellae that surround the total outside of the bone, some that surround the total inside of the bone. And then we have some, because you can't get these circles butted up perfectly to one another, there's gonna be some interstitial lamellae that have to be in between these. And I think we'll see that on another slide. If you're looking at these little osteocytes, they're connected to that central canal through these little openings or extensions of each cell called canaliculi. And you can see, based on this here, they make this nice little network that is gonna allow all these blood, uh, excuse me, all these bone cells, all these osteocytes to get nutrients from the blood vessels and send waste back to the blood vessels that are going down the central canal here. The other thing that we're gonna see in the central canal that you're not seeing on this picture is lymphatics and nerve cell, and uh, nerve, nerves traveling through there. This is part of the reason if you fracture bone, it hurts. So these lamellae are these little rings. So each one of these would be considered lamellae. Uh, these ones, a lot of times, they are called concentric lamellae because they're going around that central canal. So in these central rings. The canaliculi, like I said, are these tiny, tiny canals that make a network, a transport system that allows all these osteocytes to be supplied by nutrients. And again, when you look at these ones here, we're going to see a number of different ones here. So this one's kind of showing it with all the canaliculi and everything in there. But you can see you have a lot of these little concentric rings here, these ASEAN systems. You can see like these ones that look like a half bite of one of these. This is a concentric lamellae. And then what you have on the outside as well as on the interior, you're going to have what are called circumferential lamellae that are kind of sealing all these little columns together inside that package. And again, these interstitial lamellae connecting each of these little ASEAN systems so we have a continuous hunk of bone and not a bunch of circles with spaces in between. When you look at compact bone through a microscope, it is going to, a lot of times going to look something like this. Again, to make one, and this would be a calcified one, different than the image I showed you to start with. Calcified bone, when you look at it, again, they have to grind it down thin, so what you get is all the blood vessels, nerves, everything else that would be in here, it is pulled out. It fills in with bone dust. The cells with the nuclei that are in here get ground away and filled in with bone dust. So you can see these little concentric rings here, those are the concentric lamellae, interstitial lamellae right here. And you can see multiple ASEAN systems throughout here. There is some other canals called Volkman canals, if I go back here, that are connecting each one of these ASEAN systems to one another. So all these blood vessels are part of that blood vessel network. If we were to do a decalcified one here that we can actually slice, you can actually, whoops, sorry. You can actually see the blood vessels within this. Again, when you do one of a calcified slide, because we have to grind that, grind that bone down, it pulls all this out. But this is a decalcified version where you can see the blood vessel within that aversion canal or ASEAN canal, and you can see the nuclei of the osteocyte surrounding it. This one, again, decalcified, you can see this mature one here with all these rings, centralized canal, and all these concentric rings going around that. Again, with a calcified one here, you can see we get the black and white image a lot more, the black canals in the center here uh, with those concentric rings with the osteocytes trapped out there. This image down here is showing a couple of these centralized osteons right here connected by a canal that's going from side to side. This is called a perforating or a Volkman canal. And this is, in reality, if we were able to do it at the right plane on... Each of these ones, these two would be connected. The blood vessels running up and down here. Same with these ones. You're going to have these Volkman canals that are connecting each osteon to the blood supply, which is, again, entering that bone from the outside of the bone, obviously, and getting into the interior of the bone. You can also see some of these interstitial lamellae right here where it's not surrounding an osteon. So, like I said, mature bone, 
is going to be compact or spongy, where the immature bone is always the spongy type. Uh, you're going to have these concentric rings, a little melee, where each one is a spiral with ones in the counterclockwise direction, the other one would be in the clockwise direction on each lamellae. So each alternating lamellae, those fibers are running perpendicular to one another, but on each lamellae itself, they are spiraling in a parallel pattern. Immature bone, on the other hand, these are kind of going all different directions. A lot more osteocytes would be present in immature bone, a lot less in mature bone. And again, we get this very regular uniform structure to mature bone. We are going to have some connective tissue membranes, so dense irregular connective tissue surrounding the outside of the bone called the periosteum, so a lot like the perichondrium in that case. It is connected to the bone underneath with these what are called Sharpies fibers. These are a fiber that connects the periosteum very well to the underlying bone. There is going to be openings in this for blood vessels to enter in. Uh, these are called nutrient for ramen. Uh, there's going to be some osteoblasts underneath this periosteum, which is going to let us be able to lay down new bone or repair bone if it's damaged. There is also an endosteum, that is the inner lining, which again is also going to have some of these osteoblasts. It's a much thinner layer though. So you can see the periosteum on the outside right here. Probably the best one showing you those concentric, interstitial, and circumferential lamellae here. Like I said, the endosteums on the inside, lining all those spongy bone as well as the inner lining of the compact bone, has osteoblasts, osteoclasts as well in there, and we're going to be able to do some bone remodeling and repair with these ones here. The other thing we can see is bone. Uh, we're going to look at at least one slide of this. Bone can be made two different ways. We have what is called intramembranous ossification. This is meaning the skull bones and the clavicles. Uh, are made through what is called intramembranous ossification. You have a membrane surrounding some mesenchyme. You get an ossification system from osteoblasts that differentiate, and it's going to form bone out to that membrane to create the bone, and then it remodels it, gets it down to its finalized form, where endochondral ossification is going to start with a hyaline cartilage kind of template and convert that to bone. This happens in most of the rest of the bones of the body, so all your long bones, all your limb bones, as well as a lot of other bones throughout the body are going to be formed, the vast majority, honestly, through endochondral ossification. And it is this endochondral ossification that I do want us to also take a slide, look at the slide of it because there is these five distinct layers to the process which are really kind of neat. But when we talk about endochondral ossification, you start with a hyaline cartilage one here. What we're going to see is you get a little collar of bone that goes on the outside of the bone and you get cartilage calcifying in the interior. We are going to get an ossification center that starts working out towards the ends of the bones. You're going to get secondary centers that get on the end and work their way back in. And what you're left with, at least through puberty, so you can continue to grow, are these epiphyseal plates. These epiphyseal plates, you have cartilage growth as well as bone growth. That allows you to get taller sooner or later. Those epiphyseal plates ossify, and then you are no longer going to grow. And this shows you some of that process right here. So fetal, and, fetal hyaline cartilage, you can see it gets a bony collar. You get deteriorating cartilage on the interior. You get an ossification center that works its way out. Secondary ossification centers form that work their way towards the interior. All up through puberty, you are going to have these epiphyseal plates. These are the growth plates. We're going to take a look at one of those here. The, the epiphyses are the ends here. The diaphysis is this uh, shaft here. Once you've finished growing, those plates will completely fuse and it just leaves a little line left. But up until that point, you're still capable of growing. Uh, what we're going to look at is this epiphyseal plate and what is going on there because, like I said, the histology of it is kind of neat. So this is showing you a low version here. What we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on this area right here, which is that epiphyseal plate. And you can see as we get on to a little bit more here, we can have some distinct layers going on throughout this. So we have closest to the bone. The first layer of this is what we have is called a resting cartilage zone. Uh, this has osteoblasts in it, some stem cells that allow us to keep making cartilage. 
you then have these cartilage cells that are greatly proliferating. You get these lines of chondrocytes all lining up. This is allowing us to grow that cartilage. This is the proliferative zone. You then have these cells that get a lot larger. Hypertrophy is what the word for that is. So they have these hypertrophic ones that are getting bigger. As we get a little bit further down, they start deteriorating and they're becoming calcified. And then beneath that calcification layer, we have an area where the ossifying cells are coming in here and converting this calcified cartilage to actual bone. So if we look at all these together, you can see it right here. You have this resting cartilage, looks a lot like hyaline cartilage. This proliferative layer, like I said, lots of these lines of cartilage cells all in a line. You can see here they get a lot bigger. That is at hypertrophic where the cells are getting much larger. They then start losing their nuclei because they're becoming calcified and then you have those osteoblasts converting this to bone at that layer. I always kind of joke around and talk about this upper part here being the grading crew. Like if you're making a road, you have the grading crew that goes first. That lays down new cartilage, which as more cartilage is laid down, with these, the paving crew that's back here can come and convert that cartilage that's being made up here to bone. If the paving crew catches up with the grading crew, we are done building bone. So this is that process. So what we will do in, a, in the slides here is we will look a little bit at compact bone, look at some of the structures that are present in that. We will look at spongy bone and how it's similar and different. We will then also look at a slide of endochondral ossification taking place and try to identify these five different layers. Something like this image right here, I would expect this to be fair game uh, something that you'll be able to deal with when it comes to a quiz or a test. So we will take a look at that stuff. Things I want to show you real quick is taking a look at compact versus spongy bone. So compact bone would be on the exterior right here. Spongy bone is a lot of these little spicules right here. I want to zoom in on some of this and just kind of show you the difference. So the main thing you see here, you can see kind of separated osteocytes out in here, these lamellae kind of running in these different directions. That's one of the things we see with the cancellous or spongy bone. If we were to go out to the edge here, you can see you have a centralized canal. And again, if we zoom in on it a little bit more, you can see a centralized canal here with osteocytes in these concentric rings going around it. Again, this is decalcified bone on this one. It's the only way I can really show you on this one. Uh, so that would be the difference between kind of that spongy bone and that uh, the normal osteon systems on this one. I've switched over to a uh, calcified bone slide. The main thing you see on this one, again, osteon system here, another one here, interstitial lamellae here. These would be the concentric lamellae. The main thing you can see here, here is that osteon canal, the reversion canal. These would be the osteocytes, but all these little feathery things that you see in between the here, those are all those uh, canaliculi. Again, this image does not have any Volkmann canals present within it. A Volkmann canal would be connecting to these reversion canals. They're kind of few and far between, and I don't believe any of the slides I have on these ones actually have it. But this, again, this image here shows you a calcified compact bone uh, digitized slide. Uh, again, those things that I mentioned, the version canal, the osteocytes, the canaliculi, those would all be something that would be fair game to see on a quiz or exam. A real quick look at this one with intramembranous bone formation. I'm not so worried that you see what's going on with the bone formation here. Uh, but you can see here is some decalcified bone right here. What I wanted to point out on this one is right along here, you can see all these kind of square cells that are traveling that are right along here. Those would be osteoblasts. So I wanted you to have an actual chance to see an osteoblast. So you can see some osteoblasts there. You can see them lining right here as well as right along here along these bones. Not always the easiest stuff to find, so I wanted to show it to you when I saw it. Show you with bone. I'm going to go back to the lumen uh, histology site here, uh, the Loyola one. Uh, this is showing you a fetal finger and we're looking at, you can kind of see where you're looking at here right by the joint here, but what we're looking at is this area right here is an epiphyseal plate. 
And what I want to do is zoom in on this just a bit. I already have it kind of centered where I want it. So if we zoom in on this a bit, what you're going to see is you can see up here, this looks just like Highland cartilage. This is that resting Highland cartilage. Uh, and if you remember, we had five different layers to this. You had this Highland cartilage right here. And then you can see we start getting these little rows of osteocytes here. That is that proliferating cartilage. You can see then they start getting bigger right here. That is that hypertrophic. They start breaking down right through the bottom part of this right here. Not a particularly strong layer on that one, but that is that calcified cartilage layer. And then you can see how it's getting converted to bone right along the edge of that right here. Those are your different layers of the uh, endochondral ossification. We can try it again on this one right here. In this case, you're going to be looking in this spot about right there. So if we zoom in on this again, this one's just a little bit darker. It's a little bit wider on this one. But again, you can see resting cartilage up here. We then start getting row, oops, sorry. You can see the resting cartilage is up in this area. You then start getting rows of chondrocytes right here. They then start getting larger and larger through this area. That's a hypertrophic, the calcified layer right here. Then the layer of uh, calcification by osteoblast or bone formation is down at the bottom. So those are the things I need you to see. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, I believe this is one of the, the really the last one we'll do for the bone. And from this, we're going to move on to uh, blood and then muscle and nervous tissue before we get to getting ready for a test. So at least in the winter session here. So that is it. I will see you next time.